May I come in, sir? I'm good, sir. Thank you. You know Punjabi also? No, sir. Yes, sir. Stay in Punjab. Yes, sir. I understand a little bit. I am not that fluent when it comes. Your father is working in BSNL. Yes, sir. BSNL is doing good? Uh, sir, actually, not so good. In fact, it is suffering losses of about. Tell me, after, after three years, where BSNL will be in your view? Must you talk to your father about BSNL? After three years, what will be the future of BSNL? Uh, three years or two years? Sir, I feel that uh, with increased attention of government to BSNL in terms of budget and uh, commercial flexibility, like currently BSNL is rolling out 4G. So I feel that uh, we can be optimistic about it. And uh, provided the HR policy is uh, a little more robust. So we can be optimistic. But it's a public sector. Yes, sir. Providing services to the people. Yes, sir. If they can get services from the private, uh, other private uh, service provider, why should they be um, Sir, I feel that uh, BSNL has some added advantages in terms of uh, defense and security as well as last mile delivery of socio-economic benefits. Because BSNL has very robust network of optical fiber uh, cable which is about 7 lakh kilometers, 66,000 telecom towers and a very popular broadband. And since it's a PSU, the main motive is public service. So we can capitalize on that and ensure that uh, the basic crux, that is uh, the digital divide, it is bridged. At the same time, an emerging issue of cyber security is also coming. But can we, uh, this can be that the other uh, public sector, private sector take it over? And all those guidelines of uh, removing that digital divide can be there. Sir, I feel that uh, telecom is a strategic sector. So, presence of at least one PSU would be in the betterment of uh, the government and the economy as well as the national security. The PSUs like private sector PSUs, main purpose is what? Profit now. It's not uh, social security services and all. So, coming in mind that it should be profitable. Otherwise, leave it, let it go to the private sector. So profitable, yes, because we need revenue to provide services. But the main motive should be using that profit to ensure the adequate quality and timely service delivery, which I feel that BSNL can do. Quality, if you go for quality of service and timely services, I think private service provider is better. So at present, yes, but I feel that if certain reforms are made, then BSNL has certain inherent strengths. Research, you have done some research on death row syndrome. Uh, so death row syndrome is a mental disorder which uh, often gets induced in the death row convicts. And it is, uh, the symptoms include hallucination, extreme sensitivity, self-mutilation. You have done some real case studies? Uh, no, sir. Hmm. Theoretical. Theoretical. Yes, sir. And so the main cause is the inordinate and unexplained delay in the execution of the sentence on the part of the state compounded by the prison conditions and especially the misuse of solitary confinement. So the Supreme Court very recently held that this mental disorder is a ground of commutation of death sentence to life imprisonment. Okay. Uh, you are fond of this uh, landscape photography also. Do we observe the World Photography Day? No, sir. No, World Photography Day? No, sir. I didn't. It was yesterday. Yes, sir. I was in the World Photography Day. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Gujarat High Court has uh, stated some provisions of uh, one, one legislation which was in India. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, interfaith marriages. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, sir. Uh, I have partial knowledge about it. There was a legislation which said that interfaith marriages are uh, uh, they are the tool for forceful conversion, mm -hmm. and this was putting a ban on that. So uh, the Gujarat High Court stayed this legislation. And yesterday, I think yesterday the Supreme there was Supreme Court judgment about arrests. If lawful arrest can be done, but it is not mandatory. Some provision of uh, CRPC. 
Sorry, sir, I'm unable to recall. Tell me in the last three decades, there has been a lot of judicial activity. Mm -hmm. In what, which all areas there has been good improvement because of Supreme Court decisions? Um, so, very recently, the vaccination policy is a major breakthrough in which judicial intervention helped a lot. And so, apart from that also, there have been uh, cases where uh, on migrants issue also recently, the Supreme Court has uh, uh, asked the uh, executive to make sure that the migrants, they receive quick uh, registration because for all the benefits, registration is compulsory. So, these two are the very recent. I've talked about three decades, 90s to 1990. Uh, sir, uh, decriminalization of homosexuality, decriminalization of adultery, uh, and sir, apart from that, uh, uh, sir, uh, custodial violence also, uh, DK Basu versus State of West Bengal. And sir, uh, recently also there was uh, uh, an order about uh, compulsory CCTV cameras in the prisons this year itself. Yes, sir. Women empowerment. Women empowerment, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Permanent Commission. NDA. Yes, sir. Then environment, environment sector. Yes, sir. Privacy. Yes, sir. Put us. Right to life and privacy. Yes, sir. That's just put us on versus United Kingdom. Optional is also now. Yes, sir. Very good. From very basic. What is rule of law? Um, sir, rule of law uh, in the simplest terms is rule based on the principle of law and not on the wishes of man, Gu the governance guided by law. You mean equality before law? Yes, sir. <coughs> law, yes, sir. Okay. And what is rule by law? Sir, uh, using law to govern. So, using, uh, sir, in that, uh, um, basically, in which the man or the authority uses law for achieving his or her ends, irrespective of uh, sticking to the principles of equality or justice. Now, what is happening in Afghanistan? And you know what law they are going to follow? Sharia law. Uh, so that is rule by law or rule of law? So rule by law. That is rule by law. Yeah. And in Pakistan? Um, sir, I am not aware of the legal system. The combination of both. They have a constitution, they have all this. That's some rule of law, you can say. But they also have scheduled law, certain things on which they go. <coughs> okay, you must be keeping track of uh, Indian economy. Huh? What else is this GDP growth? Uh, so, last year our GDP growth contracted by 7.7%. And uh, currently, the forecast for this financial year is uh, about 9.5 percent by the RBI. By the RBI. Anything by IMF? So 9.5 percent. So, so RBI is following IMF. No, sir. RBI mm -hmm. has its own. Uh, so, what are the other things RBI has said apart from growth? They have said something about the status of the economy. Uh, so inflation. Mm. So, for that, uh, inflation uh, target is set about 5.7%. Uh, no, no, these are French in inflation. These are months. They said something wrong. Is it cost for worry or we should not bother? So, RBI said that it is transitory. So, as the uh, economy starts unlocking and as the vaccination progresses, the inflation will be, uh, will be soothed. Okay. Uh, what is monetization? So, monetization of deficit. No, general concept. You have monetization of gold, that is not necessary. So, what is monetization? Say gold monetization. So, conversion, conversion of that commodity into money. So, monetization means giving money value to any asset. Okay, thank you. When you withdraw the money value, then what is it called? So, demonetization. Demonetization. Yes, sir. Did we achieve the purpose for, for which it was done? So, unfortunately, the main objective was not achieved, but there were several collateral benefits. No, what were the main objectives? So, the three main objectives were curbing hmm. black money, terror financing, and counterfeit currency. So, we had not achieved any of them in any measure? So, we did. For instance, the target of uh, destroying black money was about rupees 2 lakh crore. 
Unfortunately, as per the estimates, we were able to destroy only rupees ten thousand crore. But there were several collateral benefits to demonetization. Now, what is tender budgeting? We have a concept of tender budgeting. What is that? Uh, so allocation of uh, the budget towards uh, uh, gender uh, uh, progression, for instance, uh, either uh, directly uh, schemes that directly affect women or indirectly affect women. So keeping gender empowerment in mind. Can you give one item on the budget? Which is exclusively men for this? Sorry, sir, I'm not able to think of it. Yeah, what are the nearby fund? Yes, sir. Yes. So what is that fund? Uh, so that fund was created to ensure women's safety uh, after the uh, heinous crime in 2012 and it was created in 2013 and uh, it provides for uh, uh, various uh, women's safety uh, initiatives such as Swadhar Griha and shelter homes and apart from that uh, I, I feel that uh, other uh, uh, schemes related to women empowerment are also funded from Nirbhaya Fund. I am not sure sir. Good. Last question. For promotions, should we go by seniority or merit? Uh, sir, I feel it should be a combination of both. Combination of both. Although merit should be the primary criteria. You think merit should be the primary criteria? Sir, it depends on the organization or what, what are the existing rules. But based on that, merit should be the uh, criteria. Mm. Then there is some controversy in the armed forces side. Today's paper, if you have seen, it's a debate. Whether merit should be given. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, what is the latest in uh, gender parity in army? Uh, so recently, Supreme Court has passed an interim order ordering the uh, uh, armed forces to allow women also to give NDA examination. That is. Latest. Yes. How do you see gender parity in Indian armed forces in general? So in general, uh, the Air Force and Navy have been very progressive from the very beginning. However, there was some uh, hesitancy when it came to army. So last year with permanent commission of women being allowed by the <coughs> Supreme Court, uh, there uh, that was the first when, major when step. Women in armed forces, permanent commission is the so many, uh, so many dots where we can connect and now we come to this state. Can you trace the history of women in Indian armed forces? Um, sir, I have limited understanding if I may try. Uh, sir, uh, initially during the British rule as well, there were women in the armed forces as serving as nurses. Uh, and uh, progressively, uh, even after independence, there was a lot of hesitancy. But uh, I feel the Indian Air Force was the first uh, branch to offer permanent commission to women. And uh, otherwise, there was a short service commission, which was about 14 years. And uh, even today, despite the permanent commission in all the three branches of the military, uh, women are not allowed in combat roles yet. So that is remaining. That is remaining Supreme Court intervened in that all? Sir, in, uh, in the judgment on permanent commission, Supreme Court did not uh, allow combat rules initially. So, mm -hmm. it is, it is. I think it is being deliberated upon, but there is no ruling on it. So, after women's entry, uh, women entry into on the force of Navy, Air Force and uh, Army, which comes to your mind? Was, yeah, this is the greater accomplishment, women in armed forces achieve anything? Um, sir, I am aware of the uh, women contingent, uh, contingent in the peacekeeping forces. India was the first country to do so, which was I think a very good thing, not just for the national but also for international governance. And sir, uh, uh, apart from that, I believe uh, there was a naval expedition by the all-women crew. Mm -hmm. So, how do you see third wave of pandemic? Uh, are we already in third wave or it have to come or it may not come? Uh, sir, uh, while many experts are divided as to when the third wave will begin, for instance, according to some, it has already begun and it will peak in October. But uh, there is a unison of opinion that third wave is inevitable. However, its severity depends on our vaccination 
and also the protocols that we have to follow the covid appropriate behavior but according to the experts uh, these waves would be recurring and since the uh, virus is here to stay so their impact depends on our uh, preparedness and uh, how sincerely we take all the measures okay uh, ask us um why do you will uh, we require lawyers i'm sorry sir. why do we require lawyers in the society i see judge is that two parties goes with some problem judge himself can uh, decide right based on the facts presented to him why do we require lawyers i'm sure i feel that uh, the lawyer acts a bridge between the litigant and the judge and if we go by the simplest meaning a lawyer is the assistant of the court so for instance a litigant may not be that literate when it comes to legal aspects and in india especially where we follow adversarial system there the judge is a neutral umpire and the lawyer assists the judges in dis- reaching the decision in a fair manner so i feel that lawyer is an important link in our justice system is adversarial system as uh, in adversarial system uh, the judge is uh, is is uh, a neutral empire and uh, the trial or the proceedings it is being led by the respective lawyers of the party, uh, parties that is either for in, in the in the criminal case it is prosecution and defense and based on the findings the judge okay. pronounces the government recent years talks about non adversarial approach to solving issues Uh, can you think of uh, any of uh, the instances where government has introduced? Um, uh, sir, uh, for instance, under the family law, in the family courts, uh, legal representatives are not allowed. In in that, the parties they only approach the court, and there is no lawyer in between. Yeah. Um, sorry, sir, I am not able to hear. Uh, if I could go to some some place in Rajasthan. My choice is Jaipur and Udaipur. How would you convince me to come to Udaipur? Um, so uh, Udaipur is the city of lakes, and uh, apart from a rich uh, natural heritage, it is also uh, very famous for its cultural heritage with a very vibrant culture, which is a uh, uh, very diverse. And in there, you will find. It's true for Jaipur as well. Yes, sir. What is special about Udaipur when you come there? Sir, I think the most striking feature about Udaipur is the uh, town planning, because over the period of four hundred years, the different maharanas of Udaipur they have contributed to the entire planning of Udaipur. For instance, in uh, my area, which is Girwa, there the eight lakes they are interconnected, and it is also believed that it is one of the first instance of uh, river water interlinking in the entire world. So it is a very fascinating feature. So apart from that there's also a place called Shilpgram which is a rural art and craft complex in which you will find uh, artists from various places not just Udaipur but also from different regions of Rajasthan including Jaipur So I feel that uh, Udaipur is like all in one package when it comes to the culture of Rajasthan uh, Supreme Court made some appointments uh, yesterday Yes sir Can you tell me about this Uh, yes sir supreme court has currently a vacancy of 9 judges out of a total sanction strength of 34 so the collegium recommended the names of 9 judges out of uh, which 4 uh, are women is there nepotism in judiciary um sir uh, it, it, it there the opinion is divided on it so if you i take largely the major uh, high courts and supreme court are controlled by certain families or certain houses from which they just keep coming up uh, sir i feel that uh, it is more of uh, the case of merit and the uh, appointment system although it is not that transparent but it ensures that uh, there is uh, merit is given so there's no case for nepotism in judiciary up uh, sir there might be instances but uh, it is not is uh, it's not proven yet so i feel that uh, merit is given priority and even if we take uh, instances of the judges who belong to the same family for instance uh, uh, justice chandrachud so i feel that uh, merit must have been the priority in his appointment because of his uh, uh, impeccable tenure uh, you talked about death row syndrome 
have you heard of something called a Stockholm syndrome? So I think I've heard the name, but I'm not aware of what exactly. Okay. Retributive justice versus reformative justice. Can you elaborate? Um, so retributive justice uh, is where uh, the punish the, the intention of the punishment is to uh, met out the same uh, uh, suffering that the uh, the perpetrator meted out against the victim. So it's like for an uh, an eye for an eye. Uh, on the other hand, uh, reformative justice is based on the principle that uh, there is a scope of reform of the criminal, and uh, he or she should be given another chance. So, in that, uh, punishments like community service, open prisons, etc., are uh, given. Can you tell me uh, some important reforms that should be made in the criminal law? Uh, yes, sir. Um, uh, sir, uh, I feel that a few major reforms could be uh, firstly, the sentencing policy itself. Although a reformatory approach cannot be used in all the crimes, but an option could be given to the judges. So, since uh, right now the punishments are only retributive, so sentencing policy could be amended. Secondly, uh, there is a few uh, places where there is a lot of ambiguity. For instance, the definition of sedition or for the difference between culpable homicide and murder. So, there also a lot of scope of uh, narrowing down the definition is required. Apart from that, sir, uh, there is judicial pendency. There are uh, police reforms that are pending, prison reforms that are pending. So I feel these could be the initial points of reforms. What is your conclusion on this publication, Social Media versus Natural Justice? Uh, sir, uh, in this, uh, I was arguing whether judges should be using social media because there is uh, uh, the, the friends in terms of social media may not be friends in real terms. However, there is a, a real likelihood of bias in case any party is in the friend list of the judge. So my conclusion was that being the citizens of India, the judges are entitled to their opinion and entitled to use these services. However, uh, just like in uh, uh, offline mode, there is a code of conduct for the judges. For online also, there should be a code of conduct for the judges. And I made a few suggestions in that. What do you think about uh, live telecast of uh, trials, which is already done in a lot of countries? Uh, sir, I feel it is a very forward-looking step as it brings um, um, the judges closer to the public and it also makes the entire procedure very transparent. Uh, for instance, sir, I have been to Supreme Court on my internship and it was very difficult to uh, locate the courts and see all the hearings, especially if various important matters were going on simultaneously. So I feel with this, it will be easier to access justice and be legally aware of what is happening in the country. Uh, that's good, uh, photography. <clears throat> How is it uh, different from, let's say, portrait or regular photography? Um, so, the essence of landscape photography is uh, capturing the outdoors. So, for instance, portrait is when I click a picture of a person. So, that is portrait, but landscape could be different things such as uh, mountains, lakes, architecture, etc. What are the difference in settings or you know equipments which is used for landscape versus urban? Uh, sir, so basically, uh, there is a concept of exposure triangle in photography which includes ISO and shutter speed and aperture. So, for landscape, since the view is a little larger, uh, so focus is also needed to be a uh, bigger. So, there uh, the aperture is narrower so that uh, the depth of field is more. So, in that case, what happens? In portrait, we see that apart from the subject, the background gets blurred. But in landscape, we need a sharp image. So, in there, uh, these are the settings which need to be. Can you name some prominent landscape photographers? Um, sir, I am really inspired by uh, Ashok Dilwali and Ansel Adams. Okay. Okay. Yeah.